when I came on staff, like oh, nearly 12 years ago, Mark was involved with ministry back with Dan McCoy. And so he's the one that first introduced us to uh, the opportunity available at Scottsdale Community College with the Community College Initiative Program. So he kind of showed us this piece of paper. And that was, you did. That was a very fruitful little vein that we followed for 10 years. It was really blessing. And so they just restarted again at Mesa Community College. It took a little break, but they're doing it again. So, so this is great little opportunity where students would come from strategic countries for one year to study here on a scholarship. And, and so when they started off with, with our program, they'd stayed at your house for two weeks before they moved into their apartment. So you really got, they became part of your family. You, you know, you really kind of imprinted with them. So it was really, really fun. So some of our best friends and students that we follow up with are, are from that program. So yes, Mark, you helped with that. Uh, I'm Scarlett and I'm applying to be a part of ISI. Woo. And I'm eager to hear more about what they do and how they do it, what the Lord's leading. Thanks. Trinity? Hello. Come on in. Hi, I'm Trinity. Hi. Say your name. Hi, I'm Kay. Very well, this, this is the screen, so. Oh, that's the screen. Yeah. I'm in a good spot. We're yeah. in the nursery, so. <laughs> I'm surprised I don't watch TV. I think. Yeah. We just went to introduce ourselves, let you, uh, if you don't mind. Who am I? Yep. Ed Young. Nice. Is that all you want? That's all. Fine. Unless you want to share more, Ed. <laughs> oh, nice. All right. Well, this is the workshop on international student ministries. And, um, my name is Charles, and this is my wife Tracy. We're going to fix it later, but uh, this is actually one of the, we were talking about the community college initiative program. So this is a group of the 16 that would come from different countries. So they, I was the official photographer during that time. So um, we also I use them as part of our website. So I want this to be interactive. So at any time, feel free to you know interrupt me, and you can ask any questions. And um, we want to kind of learn together as we go here. So d this is kind of the website that we have right now. Of course, we need to probably update it again. But during COVID, we really wanted to try to reach more students, uh, you know, online. And uh, so it's always, uh, you guys should do some website building too. You know, it's, it's always a challenge to make sure that they're dynamic because they can become static very easily. And so, and so that's something that the students, we always have to be aware of with International Students, Inc. Uh, that, that we're working with the you know, a younger culture now. And actually, the culture that's coming up now, um, Z, they say they have, and this is generous, an eight-second attention span. So that, that's the freshmen coming into the universities right now. You know, because they grew up with a device. And if they don't like what they see, you just give it a swipe and, and move on to something else. So that's, that's our, our reality. But, uh, you know, like I said, feel free to ask any questions any time particularly one, how can I become involved with international students? Mm -hmm. So here is a picture of my wife and I at one of our tabling events. Um, we're both full-time missionaries with International Students, Inc. We love what we do. We have three grown children, and uh, we minister together, mostly at ASU, but we do some with attorneys and other campuses as well. So I came to Christ as an advertising executive when I was 25 years old, I actually pursued the American dream, all the things that I thought would make me happy, all the you know money and, and, and the things and I just got them and I just realized wow this is not what I want you know so I just asked God to reveal himself to me he had me fired for my nice job and just completely dependent on him so he just kind of got my attention and so I worked at a church for 17 years I was involved at church my wife and I went overseas for three years in South Africa it really kind of opened our eyes to uh, different cultures and how Americans don't really you know, do that very well, and, and, and so when we came back, we really wanted to be more hospitable and, and have our house more open, and we started working with international students, volunteering, and we just loved it, and uh, International Students, Inc., in particular, and my heart just resonates with their mission that, that they exist to share Christ's love with international students and to equip them for effective service, discipleship, in cooperation with the local church and others. I, I think that that's so important. A lot of times mission organizations become more parachurch and they just think they're the end to themselves but ISI really wants to give away the ministry in one sense that we want to share with others and we want to work with others so I think that that's um, an important part of, of, of why I'm such a fan for International Students Inc. 
Um, so let me just begin our time in prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to share what you're doing. And, and Lord, we just ask you to help us to hear from you if you want us to do more in this area or, or some other area that we're going to hear about uh, over this weekend at this conference, Lord. So we thank you for this opportunity, for all the people who put it together. Bless uh, our time here in this workshop and the, the main meeting tonight and tomorrow, Lord. We just commit it all to you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so what does cooperation look like? Um, the Reagan was at our warm welcome. <clears throat> it was pretty crazy. So we had 450 brand new international students. We knew this sweet spot existed for a while, and it took us a while to, to get this to where we could have a welcoming event when the students first arrived, um, because that's when they're really open to having a new relationship. So they, we used to have, um, International Students, Inc. used to have a model of ministry called the Friendship Partner, to where we actually would have somebody on staff, or not on staff, but they'd work at the university, and they'd connect students with volunteers. That, you know, that was encouraged. <clears throat> and then that worked for a number of years, but then I, I kind of blame this, but other things too. But they're no longer disconnected and, and lonely and needy. So the students, when they arrive, are pretty well able to do whatever they need to do. They can get a car, food, order anything. They can FaceTime their parents, their friends. They, they're not as needy as they used to be. But they do miss that community, that family, and you will. So, so that's what we really felt like. There was this, before school, before they get busy, we want to have this opportunity for them to connect with with somebody that could be their friend. And, and so we can't do that ourselves, even though there's a lot of staff here. When you're talking about 450 students, that's why we invite people like Reagan to come and, and, and ask them to connect with a student. And so, so we heard lots of good stories coming from that. So we um, would also open up to all the evangelical groups at ASU, Bridges, Friends of International, if they wanted to come, Life Among the Nations. And we'd invite them to come and meet the students as well. So we don't see that as competition. We see that as, as healthy. That uh, we, we really find this is kind of funny that most of the students that will come to our group will also go to their group and, and so they'll just check us all out and they might settle on one but it's, it's kind of like why, why are there four different gospels of Jesus' life different perspectives different ways of communicating so we're all we're all talking about the same Jesus and so when we're talking about discipleship it really needs to be more life on life so with our group you know we, we have more students that we can disciple and same with bridges so we really need those community volunteers and, and church members to come alongside and help so that's really why we give it away um, and, and so this is like making a lot of noise for Jesus big events like this what we call access where we can meet the students so this this happens to be before school begins it actually is before orientation happens so these students have arrived they're trying to set up their house as best they can they're trying to meet people do things and so it's just a great time we already have the one scheduled january 5th thursday january 5th is our next one and once again it's before orientation and we uh my student leader is ordering seven thousand two hundred dollars worth of food the ASU pays for, so it's just a great opportunity that exists again. And so we also have small groups, you know, within us that we, um, we call them life groups, where we kind of try to do the discipleship, more um, intentional one-on-one. -on -one. So we're, we're looking to multiply those as well, too, that we don't want to just have our staff doing that. We want to open that up and have churches and individuals and groups having more group, more, more life groups, more discipleship happening outside of what we can do. So at this time, I want to share a little um, opportunity that, that is, uh, International Students Inc. has lots of opportunities for people to learn more about um, cross-cultural evangelism and ministry as well as our individual model. So I'm just going to share this quick little video. This is our friend uh, in New York. Is that loud enough? All right. Let's see. I can do that from here. I got subtitles. Yeah, so Terry and her team put together a bunch of um, small, short little training videos. And this is like the first introductory one, so. Brings about a million international students annually to study 
at universities and college campuses, and it's a tremendous opportunity for the church to reach and to minister and to share the love of Jesus with people who typically don't have access to that. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, so we're asking the Lord of the Harvest to raise up volunteers just like you who would be willing to join us on the front lines by befriending an international student. The other thing is that international students are often spiritual. They are coming at an age and a time in their life where they're trying to figure out what they believe, what really empowers them in their lives. They often are looking for friendship. They're looking for people who can show them around and who can help them get acclimated to their new environment. The students they got are bringing to America are super gifted and friendly. They are curious about learning about American culture. They're curious about learning about new perspectives. And so they're coming with a lot of questions. They have questions about what Americans believe. They have questions about their background belief. They have questions about what is this thing of Christianity and this person called Jesus. And so we have a unique opportunity to step in and answer some of those questions and to meet some of the needs. Because when they come, they're often really lonely. They don't have a network of family or friends. And really, not only are there spiritual needs, but there are emotional and physical needs that come as they come as a newcomer to this country. And so we get to answer questions, but also get to be the love of Jesus. Can you imagine living in another culture and all the new things that you would have to learn? Wouldn't you too want a loving friend that could help you along the way? In Leviticus, as he's commanding the Israelites, he says, you were once foreigners in Egypt, and so be welcoming and gracious to the foreigners that come among you. And I think in that way, we remember that we are once foreigners, and we get to welcome and bless the foreigners that come to live among us. Most of the students that come are coming from the 1040 window, places where you can no longer go as traditional missionaries. And God in his sovereignty and his love has brought them right here. There are international students that live in your community, and if you will open your eyes and seize the opportunity, God will use you to reach the nations through international students. How might God change the nations if every international student had a loving friend who was willing to pray for them, include them in their life, and be willing to share the greatest story ever told? So yeah, Jesus commands us to go and make disciples of all nations, and as they said, they're they're kind of coming here, and, and I think the first step, as we were talking earlier, is just to befriend them, and then just to disciple them to faith. If God's calling them, then that's the first step. That we believe that's what, what Jesus did, um, and that uh, from one man He created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and He determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after Him, and perhaps feel their way towards Him. And find him, um, though he is not far from any one of us. So just that, that God does, uh, you know, call students to salvation. He calls them here in, into our neighborhoods, into our backyards. It's just a great opportunity. So that's why we, you know, really see it as being important. So they talked about the the Tempe ten. I mean, the the ten forty window, you know, and that's that's so true. But we have what we call the the Tempe ten forty or the Phoenix ten forty. Is that they literally are just so many the the. Tempe uh, 85282, 85281 zip code is the most densely populated, but I guess they've split that now, so I have to figure out what that, what that means. But there's just so many students from countries where we can't go. And, and even, like, there's a big um, need to, for reaching out to students from Japan. And this is kind of an interesting fact. Japan is, like, one of the hardest countries to reach. You know, not because, like, Russia, it's, it's, you can't go there. You can go there, but they're just not interested, and it's very expensive. So missionaries just really don't succeed in a country like Japan. But they're coming here to learn English, and they really love to have American friends and to learn more about our, our lives. So it's just a way to, to witness to them. So um, this is a, a – we recently just went on a hike. So we, you know, we have lots of ways that we bless them. <clears throat> and um, – and that's just one of the ways is by having events and activities for them. And um, we also partner with uh, 
a organization that's here um, to do businesses missions that we hold career networking events. Again, that's you know kind of partnering with other people. Um, uh, no, that is actually at the student pavilion. Okay, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, Brandon um, did that. That's like one quarter of the room where we had the warm welcome at. So it's just a small little slice of that, if you will. Um, but, uh, you know, we're just meeting, uh, trying to meet uh, felt needs and then provide the opportunity for those that are interested in, in to go deeper spiritual with a friendship or, or to go to a Bible study, a Bible discussion group. So we reach them to, to teach them and, and send them. So we, we kind of have a model ministry that begins with prayer and God's Word and the Holy Spirit, but then we have those access, access, access events like the warm welcome and, and hiking and, and the uh, like uh, career networking to where we bless them. And then we look for people of peace, those that God is maybe calling to himself, those that are interested in, in spiritual things. And, and so we invite them to join us in, in a life group or a Bible discussion group and just... Uh, you know, help them see who Jesus is and that, so they can have enough information to make a decision to follow him. And then we try to train and equip them to, to multiply, make disciples and make disciples. That really is what our heart is. So um, these are just some of the different pictures of, of blessing, um, some of the different ways we've done it. We, you know, lots of ways to do it. Um, so we're trying to meet them online before they even arrive and answer questions because, you know, they're all doing that, right? They're, they're going online. They want to know where they're going and information. So we pick them up at the airport. And this is very fruitful, too. When you can, you know, we have the online airport pickup that when you meet them and bring them home, it's like, again, it's imprinting. They just, you really make an impression on them. And then it's those students that usually become really good friends. And then help them get it set up, you know. And, and we've done that numerous times, giving them free things or, or drove them to thrift stores or, or help them bring some Ikea. And then when you're there, you can just ask, you know, do you mind if I just pray for your new home? And they're, like, they're all very spiritual. They, even the Muslims and Hindus, they just would love that. And so they really appreciate it. Um, and going shopping, banking. And these are all things that, that get the warm welcome that we're encouraging the volunteers to just like, they all have these needs. They just moved here. They're just setting up. So if you make a friend, I guarantee you they're going to need help with all of these things. You know, homesickness and, and, and some of them have language. Bob uh, teaches English classes. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a need that they have. Um, and advice and help. I just learned today from one of our Afghan gals that wasn't returning the call for the longest time, they found out she was very sick. Her, she was completely covered with a rash, and she didn't know what to do. Oh. So she just didn't, you know, reply to her, her, her person that was trying to reach out to help her. So that's just showing the love of Jesus Christ, you know, blessing them. And then find, you kind of look for those people of peace, um, and then discover, just to go to those small groups. Make sure Bob there. Can you see um, and then follow. So this, you know, this is really we want to always keep this as our end goal. Is we really want to make disciples and make disciples. So we really need to be modeling that all along the way. You know, you can't really disciple without evangelism, and you shouldn't be evangelizing without discipleship. You have to just be showing them what you eventually want them to do. You know, so um, and then multiply. That that we did the. We did the, you know, research that kind of showed that a lot of students would come back and they didn't really continue in their faith. So that's why we're, we're doing more of the Discovery Bible method, you know, to where it's more intuitive of, of them discovering the truth instead of just having this master teacher model where I think it tends, Western Christianity tends to have that as our church model. But that's not a very, you know, transferable, reproducible, uh, you know, simple version for them to do when they go back home. So... So, yeah, so I think I might have skipped one. Let me see if I can go back. Yep, just our model again. Okay, so you can join the field this month, okay? So this is uh, a QR if you're interested. That was one of those videos. But this, it really is, it has about our small groups and, and all these different things um, if you're interested. Um, and then so, real quickly, so this is like a typical ministry funnel. And, and, you know, most churches have that to where you kind of, okay, we have the people start here, and then we'll kind of move them down here, and eventually we want them to be involved in our ministry, if you will, and stuff like that. So, and there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but, but I kind of noticed that international students here in the Phoenix area, we, we kind of do a little bit differently. So we kind of have the model, you know, to where we, we meet students, and then we want them to, uh, to attend something, and then we want them to get in a group, and then to be discipled for service and then become one of our student leaders. But at the same time, we're also giving away these students to other groups and to churches and to even individuals 
to to disciple to faith and, and to train, equip, and, and to disciple for service. So it, it kind of it creates like multiple funnels, and we don't feel like the need for it all needs to come back just to our group, you know, that we realize that we want to be very generous and, and just allow God to work in people's lives because we just, you know, the harvest is so incredibly ripe at ASU. There's just so many students, so many needs. It's overwhelming. I mean, each semester recently we've just been overwhelmed with just the, the every, you know, all the students that want to be involved in our club. We just don't, you know, it's just hard to know how to, to, to meet them all. So we really are, are trying to create a model that can have more people involved because our, 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 all of our objective is to see them disciple to serve God you know that's and, and serving God that, that's, that's you know that's what God wants that's where his heart is so how can you join the mission field this month so we're here to help you find a role so church partnerships we'd really we're, we're trying to get more church partnerships you know to where they come alongside and, and, and want to to work with international students because there's just so many advantages if you really think about it like if a church is interested in cross-cultural ministry if they want to you know go overseas for short-term missions or to invest in one particular nation then we probably have some students from that nation that we could help them introduce them to if yes uh, I was almost done copying down that last screen but I wasn't able to get the wow okay and I can give you a copy of this whole thing it's one further and yeah, I mean shorthand but I'm curious just to get those last few. Yeah. Okay. So, like, uh, like if a church is interested in, in evangelizing in their neighborhood, okay, then just working with international students is helpful because, uh, you know, our students are, are almost all spiritual, and they're interested in spiritual conversations, which Americans are not, you know. So it, it kind of gives them the opportunity just to begin to do something in the way of evangelism and sharing their faith. So it's just, it's just a great opportunity. And then also just, you know, if, if what we're able to do is we provide the students. So if a church wanted to do like a sports ministry or they wanted to do a, uh, an English class or to have a, a, a life group or, you know, we don't want to put it in a box, but whatever, however they feel led, like that's how they want to bless the students, um, then we would invite students to that. Like we had a church partner that said we want to do career networking event. We say, well, let's, we can make that happen. So we organized the room, and we invited the students, and we've had two now, and they've been very successful. So that's, that's, that's what the opportunity that we can do with, with churches is to help them. Um, so encourage and, and, and train, you know, with the cross-cultural ministries and opportunities that are available. And then we bring missions right to them. It's just, you know, the stories and, and opportunities are, are just uh, very encouraging. In, in, and contagious, you know, it will create some excitement for the for the church, some you know awakening, if you will. So, what's your role? How can you how can you help? So, um, here's something my wife and I learned about. Um, this is kind of a funny story. As we were working at the church, I was working at the church, so I, I didn't make a lot of money, and we needed you know more income, and we weren't sure exactly how to do that. <clears throat> um, God kind of told me I shouldn't get a second job, but. But then we learned about this opportunity where we could have a student stay with us who's learning English. And, and since we don't speak any other language, you know, that would be helpful because they would, they'd have to communicate with us. So we provide breakfast and dinner. Uh, you just had to provide a room. Well, the problem was that we didn't have an extra room. We had three children at home at the time, so we didn't have an extra room. So I got this brainstorm of an idea that we could move our son into the garage and rent his room, you know, and get $400 a month. So I thought, this is a great plan. I would give my son $50 a month to move into the garage. So we literally moved the car out and moved his bed in. And, and right away, we started hosting students. And he loved it out there, so much so that he stayed out there for like 14 years. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually, I made it into a proper room, you know, even gave him a bathroom. But when we started out, literally, it was in my workshop and where we parked the car. And his friends would come over at night. They and, and they'd play, play with, with all my power tools while I was sleeping on the other side of the house. He eventually started a garage band where they would make all kinds of noise, and we didn't hear on the other side sleeping. So, yeah, he, he really was blessed by that. But, but now it's up to $800 every four weeks. And, and so this is just a great discipleship opportunity, too, that, that exists right now. They, they, they don't have enough host families. And if, and if you're interested, you give them my name, and we get $100 for referral. So, like, we had a nephew that was wanting to, to move into our area. But he says, it's too expensive where you live. And I said, well, let me, let me tell you this. 
you buy a little bit more house with a one extra room, and you can get $800 every four weeks by renting it out. So he's been doing that ever since, too. So he stayed in Tempe and then just yeah. got something a little bit more. So, um, And then this is a, right in front of us. I sent out invitations today to, to have international students join you for Thanksgiving. That this is a great first step is that, you know, there we have students that are signing up that would love to go to American House for Thanksgiving. There, there are studies that, um, that, that, that say that over 75% of the international students that come to the United States will never go into an American House. And it's actually, they will say it's higher than that. I, I would say 75 is, is, is definitely probably pretty accurate. I, don't, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's more. I mean, I don't know. I've had students come to me when they, after they graduate and they're going back to their home country, and they'll give me numerous gifts. And it's because they didn't give them to anybody else. They had nobody else to give them to. So it's just sad. You know, their parents, okay, you're going to this other country. You're going to meet people. You give them these gifts from our country. And then they'll, at the end of the time, they, they, leave, us the they leave us with the <laughs> gifts because maybe we're the only people we met, they met, they met or connected with. And so, I mean, just imagine if you're going into another house, I mean, another country, you'd want to, unless, you know, unless you're, you know, typical American, which I don't think any of you are, you would want to know what the culture's like in this country. You'd want to experience, you know, what, a, what their meal, what it's like. Because if you go to your American hotel and you go to your American, you know, tourist places, you're not going to really experience that. So, so that's one way to help right now. Um, so that's the, I guess, the rest of the Thanksgiving spiel. How many um, students are there on campus? I mean, international students? Um, at least 13,000. So how many new ones came in, in August, Bob? Uh, I think it was four. 4,000. 4,000 new students. First, first time international students. First time international. Across all four of the all of the, ten, the ASU campuses. From, from I mean, from where we have them, from like you know, Albania to Zambia. You know, they, they come to our to our warm welcome. They they're interested in our groups and stuff like that. We have an opportunity for for them to have an American friendship partner. You know, it's just we just don't have enough resources and volunteers to really help to to meet with all these students. You know, it, is, it does get harder that once the semester starts. They do get busy, and it does get harder. But there is that opportunity at the very beginning. So that's, we want to be strategic with that. So, um, so yeah, so that's the warm welcome that we're planning right now on January 5th. And, um, and so this is, like, our page to, to find out more about becoming a ministry partner with International Students, Inc., so we have a web page with more information about what that looks like and stuff like that. So I guess we have some questions. Probably. Time here for some staff. If you have any questions? Any question at all? There's no bad questions. I would be interested in knowing if you have an international student ministry at uh, NAU. We do not. That's been an item of you know prayer and concern. We would love to start one there. We we had Joan and Stan Alf. Did a little bit for a while, but they are no. She passed away, so they're not doing that. But I think there's probably an openness that you know the ASU culture kind of transcends to those other cultures, campuses. So yeah, if you're interested, maybe we can get this information. Yeah, because we're definitely interested in having someone on that campus. I was at a, a ministry in the name of the town, but it was. Not far from uh, Yosemite, and uh, international student campuses were sending people up there to have a weekend away, and it was a tremendous opportunity to have a group of people. They 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 had facilities for it, mm -hmm. and I've wondered for a while about having students go to Grand Canyon. I I live in Sidesville, and uh, I've, I've taken people to. I enjoy taking people to the Grand Canyon, but there's a lot of uh, creationists that use the Grand Canyon as a model because it, it really is a demonstration mm -hmm. of creation. Um, and uh, I'd sure like to see something like that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we'd love to see that too. It's, uh, there's, there's lots of opportunities. We don't have anybody at Tucson either. But yeah, we regularly take students to the Grand Canyon. That's on their list now, along with uh, the Antelope Canyon and 
<laughs> a horseshoe bend. Antelope Canyon is really big on their list right now. Any other questions? I have, but like when you guys come across like Christian international students, do you guys are you guys engaging them, trying to get them connected? You mentioned DMM. Are you trying to raise them up as leader in the DMM model to reach their own nations? Like, what does it look like if you come across an international Christian? Student? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I mean that's that's always been you know one of our big prayers before every semester is that we would meet new international students that are Christians, particularly ones that have a heart, you know, for the nation. And, and so that's always, that's, that's those, you know, people of peace, yeah. that would be like the A1, the best ones that we could find. So it, it's, it's hard that there's not a lot that, yeah. that come with that gung-ho. Um, but uh, we're, we're really trying to be more discerning and intentional when we have like a warm welcome and trying to find those those Christian people, because we, we want to help them. We want to, you know, help them, because, I mean, it's, it's a really sad statistic how many people turn away from their faith when they go to university. And it's, and it's Christian, Muslim, Hindu, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's just a fact. So if you can help them see the need to be on the offensive, not just on the defensive, trying not to sin and get caught up in the American culture, but to help to, to engage with them, so... Yeah, so I was just talking with a, a, a woman here whose son is a freshman at ASU, and she says her son would really be interested in, in this. He's an American, but like, yeah, we, we, would, we would love to partner with him, you know, that uh, that, that would be. We, we have some, you know, we're, we're a student-led club, so all of our leaders have to be students. So, yeah, so that's been a challenge in the past, too, is, is sometimes just finding enough student leaders that are actually Christians to, to help our club exist. So, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a big concern and need. So, like, just I'm mean, a nuts and bolts kind of person. Like, logistically, like, how many students do you need three. to keep? Three. You just need three. three Where three or more are gathered, they can okay. start a club at ASU. Some clubs just have three. And they could be, and and, and with th- with three, you get unlimited access to funds and resources at ASU if the if they ask. That's the way it's built. There's literally millions of dollars available. Use the buildings on campus for free. Mm, very cool. Mm-hmm. It's like really cool. when we do the big warm welcome, I mean, it doesn't cost us anything except like printing up name tags and a few incidentals. But the facility and the food is all covered by issue. Okay. I love to use the example of Bob's son, when he was in school, was the president of, of Crew, and he did a big evangelical outreach with an illusionist at the Gamage performing, like a Broadway show. Facility and and just you know all all at issues done. I think ultimately they got like fifteen sixteen thousand dollars to cover everything in issue. All you have to do is ask. Good questions. Anything else? I think we've already reached our time limit, huh? Well, I, wow. I have another question. Sure. Do you ever reach out to the unbelieving American students on campus? We reach out to them, but they definitely would not be our, our primary target audience. So, I mean, we, you know, it's very fine line because you can't really say no to anybody at ASU. You can't be exclusive. You, you have to be inclusive. And so we'll be tabling on campus. This has happened numerous times where you're having international students club. Mark's been there, international students club. And, you know, someone will come up and say, you know, I would like to join your club. And, like, you know, well, we're, a, you know, based, sponsored by a Christian organization. We're a Christian club we're helping with international students. I mean, I've had guys come up to me and tell me that they want to join our club because they want to meet Asian women because they're very loose, you know, because they're very submissive is what he said. So... That's like, we, you know, so we'll say, sure, I'll take your name and number. <laughs> oh, where did that go? You know, so we, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah, there's plenty of, there's plenty, we partner, we have lots of friends that do that. We have lots of evangelical, we're part of a council of religious advisors uh, that all of, most all of them are evangelical reaching the non-Christian American students, where we were international students. That's what the beauty of it. For 75 years, they've just focused on international students. They haven't got distracted by anything else. They just like that is our purpose: is to reach international students. And that's, that's like university. And, <clears throat> and we do it well. They're like one of the yeah. most beautiful things that we can do is when we have this student. It happens all the time. This is I am transferring to San Jose. Do you know anybody in San Jose? I have a friend in San Jose. They'll pick you up at the airport and find you a place to stay. 
I have a friend in Virginia, North Carolina, and Florida. We have friends all over the United States on all the campuses, and we just connect and help one another. So that's, that's like one of the you know, family perks of being part of our club. Can I just share something? I mean, could you got technically till 6.30, everybody else is. Oh, okay, great. So. Oh, that's right, it's right at 5.30, you're right. Yeah. But it's just so easy in terms of a friendship partnership. My wife and I did that before we came on staff. And, I mean, they've helped us set up our Christmas tree, color Easter eggs, do Christmas cookies. It's like, these guys are working on their PhDs. I'm like, honey, they're not going to want to color Easter eggs. And she goes, you just watch. <laughs> <laughs> and they're downloading pictures on the Internet on their phone, and it's just, they love this stuff. It's just so easy, really, to have them and build relationships. So easy. And that's it's really the best way to evangelize with them, too. Because if you just go in with, a, you know, there's only one way to God, and it's through the blood of Jesus, and, you know, that's, that's not very appealing to, to most people. So, but if they just see this wonderful American family, because if you think about it, what, what do they really know about American families? All the people living all over, people living in Germany, what do they know about American families? Just what they see on TV, you know, just the, the television programs and the news. And, and we know that's not very pretty. And, and they think that's what a Christian nation looks like, you know. So it, it's really we have a we have a lot of work to do in just in, in just kind of giving people the truth about what a, an actual Christian looks like, what a Christian family looks like, a Christian marriage. Well, and I was just talking to one of the Afghan moms that I met, and she gave this example that one of her one of her students uh, got lost. She got off on the wrong bus, and she got scared and panicked and contacted her. And she caught up with her, and then she was able to give her the story of the lost um, sheep, how Jesus left in 99 and came back. You know, it's just little practical examples. I don't know if she knew that was from the Bible, but, you know. Yeah, we just want to be open, you know, to what, what, what God is doing, you know. And he's doing a great thing at ASU right now and just bringing so many people. Um, international students, and there's such an openness. Bob just forwarded an, an article, you know, from the president, um, Dr. Crow, saying he's fighting for religious freedoms to stay on campuses. He says that's just crazy that any university would deny such a basic right that all people should have. That, that, that that's just that's just asinine to think that you would deny religious liberties on on a on a university campus. And it's just, it is common sense that, yeah, you're open to all thoughts and ideas, so why would just religion be excluded from all those thoughts and ideas? It's, but, uh, it's a great opportunity. It is a great opportunity. But, like, we, we, learned, we learned last, um, I guess, January, after the warm welcome, we met some students from Afghanistan. There's a whole bunch of them all cuddled around together, all these Afghan, Afghanistan girls. And so we learned, asked you know, try to meet them. And then a few of them went to our church and they came to our, our life group afterwards. And we learned that there was a group of 64 of them that had been there since November staying in a hotel across the street from campus. And then they told us that they were so sad at Christmas because they wanted to go to church, but they didn't know anybody. They didn't know how to do that. Well, they but, said they came to Mount Carmel Catholic Church and it was closed. And they were so sad because they wanted to go inside and see what this, you know, Christianity was about. So. so, so we learned more about their story about these 64 girls. They all were university students in Bangladesh. That was a common denominator. Okay. And, and then they were all back in Afghanistan because of COVID when the Taliban invaded their country. And overnight, they said everything drastically changed for the worse. They said it was just the darkest day ever because everything changed for them and 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 they were no longer safe they, they were no longer able to go out of the house you know they'd be fully covered it's just so many things um and and then um they're also part of the um hazara people group which are shiite muslims which are the minority and actually hated by the um taliban. by the by the taliban who, or, who are of the other sunni. muslims sunni so so they're actually targeted for genocide and, and so they had the opportunity to leave during the big airlift. Remember on the news where they showed people at the airport, you know, like on the tarmac and clinging to planes? They were there for a week trying to get on a plane. 
and they finally got on one, all of them on one big cargo plane, all seated on the floor, all huddled together, you know, no seatbelt, no seat. And they were all just huddled together, and they flew them, you know, to, I think to, to, I think maybe Saudi Arabia, but then they ended up in Wisconsin, where they were in a big military base, where, because all of, all of, the, all of the Afghans who wanted to flee, who made it on, were, were all together, so there were no vetting, there was no who's a safe, who's not safe. So they were all in one big armory basic where they had to kind of decide who, who actually should be considered to be U.S. citizens. And so they finally eventually made it to the United States when they issued said, we would love to have them. We will give them free tuition and room and board and food for their stay to become students. So that was the journey that began for them. And, and so, but in talking with them, I mean, it was just so obvious they had so many needs. I mean, you couldn't, they just didn't, they didn't need a friendship partner. They needed somebody who was experienced in cross-cultural ministry, in ministry to Muslims, and in trauma counseling, really, in one sense, just because all, all they needed to talk about what was going on in their lives. So we prayed, and, and, and Renee and some other gals, my wife, we reached out to the churches, and uh, we got all the ones who wanted a, a partner, a, a, like a, an older a woman, mom. a host mom, to, to befriend them. So there's just been great stories coming from that. And that was something that had the actual official blessing of ASU. Charles went to the university and said, this is what we want to do, but we don't want to step out of bounds. The universe is like, this is great. Miss Pam, and Ms. Pam was like, yes. Because eventually, <laughs> eventually, when a lot of them went through um, English classes and after the first semester, or actually in the middle of the first semester, mm-hmm. ASU decided, you know what, we can't treat them differently than we teach all of our other students. Cut them loose. <laughs> Pam, you no longer have a job being their mom. They need to survive on their own. And so they was just like, what? I mean, they were just so needy at that point. And so they just were, you know, reaching out. And, and not all of them, but a lot of them really continue to reach out. So, yeah, it's fun to, to hear stories like that because that, that is yeah, that's just reality. I mean, you know, there's also the stories that don't have such happy endings. Like the friendship partner, when we first started as volunteers, we had this one Muslim guy from Cyprus. He was so nice, so likable, and just would love to come to our house. And then we invited him to a Christmas parade in downtown Tempe, and and he really seemed to enjoy himself. And then he just completely ignored us and and just ghosted us. We never heard from him again, you know. And the only thing I can say is that he probably talked to his his parents and told them what he was doing, and they said, you no longer talk to those Christians. Well, I think, too... um you had said you have a no. That was a long time ago. Oh yeah, and it's the same guy. You, oh you well, no, but that that wasn't right before. So he said he said you have a. He he was so you know when I first met him. Okay, it was it was when I first met him. He was telling me okay yeah I'm from Cyprus. My father owns a car dealer, the car dealer on the island. I said oh so you have a house over a villa overlooking the ocean. He's like. How did you know that? <laughs> I'm like, well, if, if, you know, if I lived in Cyprus, I would want a villa overlooking the ocean, of course, you know. So that wasn't the reason. Though. I think so, the guy. Freaked no, out. that that did get us attention, but but yeah, it is, you know, it is, it is it is a lot of fun. It really is. It's just because they're so different from the Americans, that they, they are very spiritual, they are very interested in prayer, and, and they're, they're curious, like Bob said, you know, yeah, well, I'd love to, you know, do Easter eggs, or, you know. And they tend to adopt you, it's like, many of them will say, well, this is my family. Mm-hmm. Call you like, dad, call you mom. Whatever, yeah. and they come to you like you're their parents, or aunts and uncles, or whatever, and it's just... Yeah, the other thing, you know, is because in other cultures not an American, age is actually valued. That, that it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a sign of honor to have gray hair and to be older, that they see that experience, that wisdom as, as, as something that's as, as valuable. As Americans like, oh, you know, you're irrelevant, you know? <laughs> so that's another, you know, the difference. The funniest thing is when we did a pumpkin cutting and we thought, oh, they're not gonna know it's anything what to do. We'll probably have to tell them. They pulled out their phones and uh, cut pictures of carved pumpkins, and they carved them precisely to what they saw. And they were really good. Like, I've never seen such good carved pumpkins before, you know. So, yeah. So, they, you're right. They just have fun with it, you know, things that we think are kind of a little kiddish. Or, and they'll yeah. go to church with you. Yeah. I, I, uh, 
I'm, I'm working with refugees, and I, I do audio uh, materials for refugees. <laughs> we make material. I, I work with a ministry called Global Recordings Network. I don't know if you've heard mm -hmm. of them. Gospel recordings, it used to be called. But um, I made something recently for refugees to try to make them feel welcome here in the United States. Mm. It's a script called Welcome to the United States of America. And it's all in audio. I'm putting it into various languages. And, um, but I have one in English already. And I'm wondering if, if it wouldn't be something that uh, international student to find interesting as well. I wonder if you'd listen to it personally yourself. Yeah. And then um, see what you think. Because yeah, those are the type of resources. Yeah. Me to think they would find it very interesting because it, it's 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 not evangelistic. It, what it is is just talking about Christian background of this country and how there was moral and uh, values that were exhibited here. Um, and they're losing it. But uh, anyways, it might help them to understand a little bit more about everything they see as in Christian, but there is Christian stuff. I, I can give you a, a card that has a link to our website, and you, mm. you can look it up in English. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do with our website, is because we, we know that they're looking at it before they come. So just to kind of provide that resource to help them feel more comfortable and to be having a final, feel like they have a friend before they even arrive, you know, that we help them even before they get here. This would be something you'd probably, if you talk to someone, but at least the first to find out if they would find this interesting mm. or not, and if it would be something that would help break ice, it might be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, like, on average, like, how many students are you guys working with right now? Like, is it? Do you have 25 students? Do you have 150 students? Like, what's like? Well, we have a, you like know. Working with your staff or like in one of your small groups type thing. Like, how many are going on right now? You know, it's, it's a hard question to answer. We have a pretty big mailing list because a lot of students want to join our club. Yeah. And then so if we have a fun event, a lot of them would want to just go to the Grand Canyon, you know, at a yeah. good price or something like that. So we, right now, we only have one regular group that meets. Bob oversees that on Thursday nights at C3 Tempe on the Tempe okay. campus. We yeah. have groups on the others. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we do have four international students clubs on the Polytech, downtown, and the West Campus. So he, Bob's been having about 15 coming to his, and so we have different discipleship groups, small groups that meet, but no, officially that's, you know. And, and then, like, within that, there's probably 30 that would say they're part of the group, but they don't yeah. come every single week. Mm -hmm. So. And we have English classes, and if we say we're going to go hiking, a few weeks ago they filled up three 12-passenger vans mm -hmm. yeah. just to go hiking because everybody wants to do a fun thing. So we feel like if we had more life groups that we would have exponentially more students involved in discipleship. So if you build it, they will come. If we had homes nearby with people that would be willing to have you know, students over and provide a meal and, and have a Bible discussion, that, that we would have them come. We would have students come. We're they, not trying to get our meeting up to 100 or something like that. No. We would rather parcel out a bunch of small groups. Yeah. That way we can involve volunteers and, you know, more of a tiered effect. Yeah. Yeah, because we really do want to do the DBS. We want to do Discovery Bible Method. We want to have it transferable, reproducible, you know. It, um, it's just, it just makes so much more sense because but what, what, what I'd always seen happening is, is that, you know, what he said, uh, well, I guess, is we always tend to have this, we want to see bigger groups. So we would start off with new students and we'd have, you know, 15 come to our house and, you know, we could hold a little bit more. So you go out and you find more students. And then the next week you have these new students that you're now trying to talk with. And the students that you had connected with last week are saying, well, you know, what's going on? Yeah, so that's people. just wrong, you know. You need to be talking to those people, the students you've already connected with, and say you can invite your friends. That's, that's the model of discipleship that Jesus would have done. He's like, you know, as you've seen me do, as I invited you, now you go and invite others. So that's we want to try to have those smaller groups that are more natural and, and, and easier to transfer and, and multiply. But that's that's a good question. 
So, and, you know, and then we also, we have a lot that happens that we don't know about. Like, I was getting kind of discouraged about the warm welcomes and just doing another one. It's all the work and time and effort. And, and I just, I, I was a little discouraged. And then I went to the church on Sunday, which is always a good place to get encouraged. But during the meet and greet, the first meet and greet after COVID, you know, to where our church said, turn around and say hi to your neighbor. I'm like, ah, oh, that's great. You know, so I turn around and there's Adam Reddy, who has been going, he's been going to all of our warm welcomes. And he was there with a student a Christian from India that he met at the Warm Welcome. So he's been going with them every Sunday of church. He disciples them. He's been meeting with them regularly and stuff like that. I'm like, thanks, Lord. I needed that. You know, that's just a little, keep, you know, what you're doing, you don't have to know everything. Just be faithful to what you've called me to do. So that's what we're trying to do. So I'll be available for a while afterwards. Anybody has any additional questions? I think, Bob, you've got a table to go to. I doubt there's anybody else. It's in the yeah. dark, so nobody would even know. And we'll be around. We have a table out there. Um, well, there is the, the there is a talk at seven, right? Yes, there is. And the afters, Josh, somebody. I mean, just list Doctor Del you say. Right. Yeah, it's just Del. Josh, uh, no, but there's like the, the group afters is. Uh, supposed to be somewhat well known, but obviously I've heard of them, actually. Yep. Yep. Mm. Well, Thanks for coming. If you guys have any German students, send them my way. Yeah, I have a friend from Germany, uh, or is German, and he'd always tell me the same thing. I connected one year with a whole bunch. And yeah, the German ones, ones are hard. So again, that's a student that you need to meet at the very beginning of the semester, because after a week or two, you would never know an Ameri- they're an American. They're German. They would just. Germans are at GCU. Yeah, and they assimilate in, and you, they just they get they're very Western, so you don't you don't notice them. You notice the Asians and other students and stuff like that, but the the European ones they just become you, they, you don't notice them anymore, so you don't even think to go up and ask them to, for anything and stuff like that. So they're very resourceful. So in the past, we've had them as exchange students. But I don't think we met too many exchange students this past semester for some reason. Yeah, they, they come occasionally. In January is, is, the, is the semester where the, they come from lots of countries like that. They just come for like one semester. They just come for yeah. special exchanges and stuff like that. So, yeah, January we f- tend to find more um, from Europe. So And they usually stick together too. So usually a fun group. Yeah. You grew up in Germany, hmm? Yeah, GCU, there's lots of excitement with GCU, so. Yeah. But they're coming here to, for the four-year degree at GCU? No, my sister goes to GCU, but oh. I went to the International Student Welcome Night at GCU. Oh, okay. And there was so. German students there. Yeah, and then uh, a Swiss girl as well. Oh. I hung out with this morning. Hmm. Yeah, that's nice. We'll see, because they want to speak German. Mm-hmm. Swiss? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, they speak Swiss German, but they can speak high German from school. Mm. So, they're looking for people. Because Germans, I mean, they take English since third grade, but it's not near the level it needs to be at. And so, they're looking for people to speak German. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing. Well, it's interesting that we go to GC. Are they Christian background, do you think? Or, no? Athletes. Oh, okay. They're mo- I think all the Germans I met were athletes, either tennis or volleyball, mm. the women mm. for soccer. Mm. Um, excuse me. Okay. And they're given good scholarships to come here. Yeah, and Germans put a big emphasis on sports. So, um, yeah, all the ones we met were athletes. So, mm-hmm. here on Fulbright scholarships. So. Oh, Fulbright. Okay. Yeah. Really? Fulbright? Yeah. Hmm. Well, if they keep their grades big enough. Mm-hmm. Did you say full bright or full ride? Full ride. Okay. Full ride. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay. Cause we, <laughs> I heard full bright, I, we heard, which is an academic scholarship. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. No. Like, and, and we 
interacted with several of the Fulbright scholars at ASU. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I heard full right, but I was pretty sure they heard right. So. That's because that's of the surprise. Full right, really, a student. Full right, yeah, that's kind of a contradiction there. Yeah, the Fulbrights are this other sweet little vein of students that from, from all the strategic countries that are the best and the brightest of the world. They are literally leaders in their countries that are here to get a doctorate degree. For a shorter all of them. term. For a shorter term. Yeah, and a lot of times they bring their families families here, and they're just a very, um, very influential group. Oh, that. Mm -hmm. What percentage of GCU are, of the students are Christian? Because I have yet to meet a Christian student from GCU. <laughs> you know, they there are a lot. There are a lot. Like our church, great, where we used to attend, Grace Community Church, would have, um, like. A hundred come every Sunday, and there's a lot of other churches that just have lots of them come. I think a lot of them because they they, they originally lived out in the East Valley, some of them, and so they would come here. They used to come to uh, I think uh, Antioch for a while, and so yeah, there's just they, they tend to just flock to churches on Sundays in big groups. And they go to school all the way across. They do, mm -hmm. yeah, and they'll come for Bible studies midweek and things like that. So. There's just handfuls of them will get baptized all at the same time. And mm -hmm. There's, there's, you know, there's some spiritual enthusiasm, excitement there. There is.